Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest live episode of the Free Marketeers. My name is Chris here at the Free Market Foundation in Johannesburg. Today, we have a very special guest, uh, someone who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And if you aren't, you will hopefully be after today. We have Paul Hoffman on the podcast today. Paul, how are you? Thanks for being here. I'm south of the fire, very well indeed, and a great pleasure to be with you, Chris. So if we see you running out of your office, it's not because of the fire, it's because the episode isn't going very well. So hopefully uh, it won't go in that direction. For those of you who don't know about Paul, just a quick um, introduction before we get into the meat of the episode. So Paul is a native of Johannesburg and a WITS graduate. He practiced law at the side bar from 1975 to 1980 and at the Cape Bar from 1980 to 2006. He took silk in 1995 and acted on the Cape bench at the invitation of three successive judges president. After retiring from the bar, he was founding director of the Center for Constitutional Rights and co-founder in 2009 of Accountability Now, both NGOs that promote constitutionalism. He is the author of many articles and two books, Confronting the Corrupt and the subject of today's episode, Countering the Corrupt. Paul, do you want to show us the cover of your book there quickly? Can be done. There we is go. That, is that, oh, there Lift we go. There, there we go. go. There, there we go. Perfect. It, yes. So for those of you who are interested, you can screenshot that and you can find the book, which I highly recommend that you get. And hopefully after today, you'll have some idea of what Paul talks about in the book. So Paul, the, the specter of state capture of mass corruption in South Africa is something that all citizens are unfortunately way too familiar with. One can say for poorer, for middle to poorer income citizens, they see the very real effects of corruption on their lives in terms of ever declining service delivery and that sort of thing. So I think it's a very real thing that affects people. It's not just something spoken about in the financial mail and in the newspapers on Sundays. It's a, it's a scourge in the country. So I'm hoping that given the massive task, you can give us some ideas of how to tackle this problem, even last year during the height of COVID-19 of the pandemic, South Africans witnessed looting and corruption re related to PPE um, equipment and that sort of thing. So I thought you could start off with just a uh, basic overview of the book, sort of what, what gave rise to it and your broad overview thereof. Good. Thanks very much for the opportunity, Chris. I think I should start where you started, which is with the availability of the book. Anybody who is uh, technically inclined can actually download the book off the homepage of the Accountability Now website. This book is a project of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, though it's not a book that is for sale. Uh, there are certainly uh, a lot of copies around and about, and you can get the book uh, through the uh, for free through the Conrad Adenauer Foundation or through me. I suspect that the best way to get it through me is to send me a self-addressed stamped envelope, which we used to call an SASE long before, long before the post office became redundant, uh, or uh, pay a visit to Nerdhook in Cape Town. There's a whole pile of them in my garage at home. Uh, the, the, the book is the product of um, conferences that have been organized by the Conrad Adenauer Foundation and uh, Accountability Now on the theme of uh, dealing with corruption as an issue that is a human rights issue and a rule of law issue. So we, we see human rights, especially in a constitutional democracy like South Africa's, as the obligation of the state to respect, protect, promote and fulfill the human rights that are guaranteed to all in our Bill of Rights, which is Chapter 2 of the Constitution. And we also see the upholding of the rule of law, which manifests itself in a properly functioning criminal justice administration when it comes to dealing with crime as the, uh, the means of, of keeping those in positions of power painting within the lines. I think it's the, the uh, experience throughout Africa and uh, certainly some of these um, conferences were held outside South Africa 
the uh, footprint of the uh, CAS uh, program is sub-Saharan Africa and obviously concentrating on the Anglophone countries for reasons of convenience. So the, the, um, the way that the uh, evolution of Africa as a continent has taken place is that there has been a struggle for freedom on the part of the people of Africa that has rapidly morphed into a struggle for power on the part of the politicians of Africa. And by the time South Africa got to the point where we were ready to, uh, to take a fresh look at our governance arrangements in South Africa, which until 1994 was really a parliamentary sovereignty uh, by the whites for the whites. And everybody was very much on the same page uh, by 1994. In fact, the very first draft that came from the ANC side uh, rejigged our constitutional arrangements and our governance arrangements into a multi-party constitutional democracy under the rule of law. So the transfer from the parliamentary sovereignty of the old order to the new order was not a transfer from the Nats to the ANC, it was a transfer to a supreme constitution which regards the rule of law as supreme and which requires the state to respect and protect human rights. Now, if you're going to get that right and you're going to respect constitutionalism, then the big man syndrome of Africa has no place in your dispensation and you're in a... Uh, um, a constant uh, struggle, a, uh, a need for vigilance to see to it that those who are in positions of power uh, stick to the, to the powers that they've been given and don't abuse the power that they have and certainly do not seek um, what some call hegemonic control of all the levers of power in society. That is a notion that is completely at odds with the separation of powers and the checks and balances on the exercise of power that are built into the South African constitution, inter alia, by the, uh, the courts having impartial and independent uh, agency, and by the Chapter 9 institutions, which are there to embed constitutionalism in our new order. Now, I think the, the, the short answer is that if politicians are not held to the promises of the constitution by the people of South Africa, then it's the people of South Africa that are to blame because they vote for those politicians and they are supposed to have accountability from them as well. well Paul, I wanted to ask you a bit about one of the quotes early on in the book that stands out. It's by John Steinbeck. And the quote is, power does not corrupt, fear corrupts, perhaps the fear of a loss of power, end quote. Yes, that, yeah. I mean, what, yeah, what does that tell us in the South African context? I, I think uh, Jacob Zuma was, was somewhere in the crosshairs when Steinbeck had that thought. Because you see, what, what happens when people become professional politicians is that they they really do fear losing the next election more than anything else. And the uh, tendency to paint outside the lines or to amass a sufficient fortune in the first uh, five or four years of, of uh, uh, official office is such a huge temptation on the part of so many politicians who have entered politics not to serve people in an idealistic way, but to make a living, uh, to get rich, if you like. I did not join the struggle to be poor, is what Smuts and Gunyama said very famously a very long time ago. And um, yeah, th that sort of attitude is not actually the right attitude if the idea of uh, running the... the uh, politics of the country is 
to advance the interests of the people rather than to behave kleptocratically or to attempt to capture the state or to do wicked things in order to ensure that the uh, second election is one in which you win and the third election is one in which you win by hook or by crook. And th that uh, failure to, to have free and fair elections is a problem throughout Africa. I don't believe that there has been a fair election in South Africa since the 1994 election for the simple reason that the ANC-led tripartite alliance had seen fit to regard the public purse as the piggy bank of that alliance. So you, the arms deals were used. Uh, Andrew Feinstein, who was an ANC MP, told us about that long ago. The arms deals were used to fund the 1999 uh, elections. The deal that was done with Itashi Power Africa to supply huge and useless boilers at Madupi and Kusili was used to um, enable Chancellor House to earn huge dividends and to sell at a huge profit eventually um, uh, out of a deal that should never have been done because the ANC was on both sides of the of, of the table during the negotiations. So once you have a, a, a situation in which uh, the, the rules of the game are bent or even broken in order to accommodate the ambitions of a particular individual or a particular uh, formation, you, you end up with corruption. And as Navi Pillay so famously said, Corruption is a killer, and it kills poor people. It doesn't kill too many rich people. Rich people may get caught in the crossfire between the various gangs of kleptocrats, but the poor people are, are, are left with the proverbial hind teat, as we saw, for example, in the Inkandla um, debacle, where money that was intended for poverty alleviation was simply diverted into turning the, the Zuma homestead into, into uh, what, what we see at Inkandla today. A question I had about, I, maybe this is a bit of a meta point, um, so up to you how you want to tackle it, but, you know, the view of, I guess, the FMF, of classical liberals, of libertarians broadly, you know, the state should be as limited as possible in what it does in people's lives, whether that's realistic or not in the modern world, you know, one can have that pragmatic discussion, but at least idealistically. So I wonder whether, you know, when you limit the scope of the state as much as possible, you have fewer avenues and chances for corruption. And this isn't just to say, you know, if you have a big government, then if the ANC gets in charge, it's going to be corrupt. I guess our argument would be, if you have a big government, no matter who gets into power, the temptations and incentives for corruption are much bigger. When you mix the economy and politics, you incentivize in a way, you know, deals, some favoring, it not, might not be outright corruption, but I guess these things chip away at the rule of law and the separation of of the state and the economy and people's lives. What do you think of, of that point? Is there any anything to dig into there as a way of maybe looking at how the state should act or not act? I, th I think given the history of South Africa, and because the, the playing field was, certainly in 94, the playing field was so incredibly tilted in favor of the um, previously dominant uh, sector of the population, that um, anything less than a social democracy, which is really what our, our Bill of Rights seeks to, to establish. If, if you put into your Bill of Rights things like water and food and education and access to health care and access to reasonable housing, then what, what you are saying to the world is we do need sufficient government to get people the basic human rights. And we, we, we are sitting in a situation in South Africa where that isn't going to just happen automatically or by osmosis in a totally... Um, level playing field uh, scenario simply simply because so many people had been left so far behind by the uh, less spending on education of black children and white children and 
few, few, fewer resources being put into black suburbs rather than white suburbs and so on. It, it was, it was the, the, the history of South Africa uh, put us in a situation where um, we, we would at least in the initial periods of our uh, freedom have to accept that a measure of good big government would be required in order to level the playing field. Unfortunately, what has happened is that the Gini coefficient of South Africa has moved in the wrong direction. We have become a more unequal society uh, since 94 rather than a less unequal society. We, we have had some uh, jobless growth or now we just have joblessness. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I think 43% of the workforce is unemployed at the moment. And I'm not sure if that is a pre-COVID or a post-COVID figure, but either way, it's an extremely worrying figure because it means that a lot of people are, 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 are making do out of thin air, the social security net, and w whatever they are able to hustle. And uh, that is, is not healthy for the, uh, the growth of a country. Our, our jobless, uh, joblessness, I think, is because the manufacturing sector has been decimated and um, uh, schemes like the, the BEE legislation have, have really undermined the opportunities of creating a more equal society by, instead of advantage, giving advantages to the disadvantaged, the, uh, the, the new elite who are the most advantaged of the, the black group have taken advantage of uh, the BE legislation to enrich themselves considerably. And I give you as exhibit number one, Cyril Ramaphosa, who is a billionaire today because he was able to um, leverage his position through BEE deals in, in all sorts of ways. So um, I'm, I'm afraid our social democracy is not working quite as it should. And our constitutional order, the underlying supreme law of South Africa, has, has been um, upset by the corrupt habits that have uh, developed, certainly um, in the, the Zuma years, perhaps to a lesser extent before and after that. But as you pointed out in the, in the intro, um, COVID preneurism reared its ugly head um, after the pandemic hit our shores. And we can hardly blame Jacob Zuma for that because he was living in retirement at his palace in Inkandla. Not sure Paul, if I've answered on. your question. <laughs> I think you did. I, I just want to dabble in the ideology and the abstract all the time, but I'm sure not everyone is here for that discussion. So I think you you handled it very astutely. I wanted to ask you and build on your answer there on the current president and the perception of him and quote unquote being led and that whole idea. And I guess the a bit of a trap in terms of thinking if only the quote unquote right people in the ANC got the levers of power, then all the problems would be solved. Do you, I mean, I've, I'm sort of leading the witness here with a bit of a loaded question, but do you think it's that simple as just getting the right people in the right positions? We saw last week, there were some reports that the president is going to move some people around on the, in terms of governing the SOEs, and maybe that'll make it a bit more, make them a bit more effective. But surely that, that focus on personalities is part of the corruption problem. Yes, uh, certainly um, one, one needs to regard the, uh, the level of corruption that we've reached in South Africa as a scourge right across society, a systemic problem, a problem in the structures and the operations um, of, of all, all manner of organizations. And uh, the business sector is certainly not immune. Yeah, the business sector in South Africa was very happy to bust sanctions along with the uh, the, the nats and they uh, they did bee deals with with a, a about as much moral content as the as the uh, as the sanctions busting so what 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 really um, is is the most worrying aspect 
at the moment from uh, my perspective as a tired old lawyer is that the, the, the problem of corruption in South Africa is so severe that it threatens to turn this country with so much potential and so many good people in it into a failed state simply because the good people have not seen the wood for the trees and have not stood up for their, their rights. What, what we need to understand more than anything else is that the countering of corruption is a question of political will. Yes, certainly you need to have what I call the STRS compliant anti-corruption machinery of state. And uh, that, that acronym is, 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 is it's, it's my invention, but the ideas in it come from the judgment in the second Glenister case, which was handed down on St. Patrick's Day back in uh, 2011, 17th of March, 2011. And if you don't, you, you can have the most beautiful recipe, uh, which is what that judgment really is. If you don't have anybody baking the cake, you, you, there's going to be no cake to, uh, to eat. And the problem in the Zuma years has been that there was no appetite for countering corruption. Indeed, the first thing that Zuma did when he won at, at uh, Polokwane at, at the uh, um, ANC elective conference in 2007, he passed an urgent resolution of conference calling for the disbandment of the Scorpions. And Gwedi Montashi, who is a gruff old geezer, uh, he made no bones about it. He said, I'm sorry, these guys are taking too much interest in, in important uh, uh, politicians in the ANC and their friends. They can't be allowed to do this. And they must go. And they did. They, 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 they were disbanded as quickly as the law allowed. And the second Glenister case was, was the impugning of not only the abandonment of the Scorpions, but also the adequacy of, of their replacement. So the, the majority of the court took a very careful look at the research of the OECD around corruption and said, your anti-corruption machinery of state must be specialized. It mustn't do anything else. It must be dedicated to dealing with corruption. It must have operatives on board who are trained. That's the T in STIRS. You can't possibly hope to beat the corrupt if you don't have highly skilled, trained specialists because the corrupt are forever thinking of new ways of being corrupt in order to keep ahead of, of the game. Independence is an obvious one, and independence has many facets to it. Uh, in our constitution, we talk about the ability to act without fear, favor, or prejudice. And I, I like to expand, because lawyers like words, I like to expand that expression without fear, favor, or prejudice to say, without fear of the powerful, and there are powerful people in gangs, just as there are powerful people in uh, positions of uh, elected uh, or appointed political office without favor towards your friends and uh, you find when you have to wield power that you, find, you, 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 you gather all sorts of friends from all sorts of quarters and without prejudice to the public wheel. That really is uh, the explanation, uh, the ability to act with independence. The R in STIRS stands for the resourcing uh, in a guaranteed fashion of the anti-corruption machinery of state. There's no petrol in the tank. The most fabulous machine does not move at all. So you need to have uh, human and material resources of sufficient and guaranteed order to see to it that uh, the work of the unit can be done. And the last S in STIRS, the famous acronym, is security of tenure of office. And security of tenure of office is exactly what the Scorpions did not have. And if I understand SONA of February 2021, 
the, the, the thinking of the cabinet at that time, I hope it's moved on since then, was that it would be enough to create a new statutory body that investigates and um, prosecutes corruption and is answerable to parliament, not to the executive. Being answerable to parliament is a, a, a step in the right direction because parliament is a multi-party body and there is less place to hide than there is in the, uh, in the cabinet. But uh, to, to, to leave it as a statutory body means that the new body will be exposed to exactly the same risk that turned out to be the Achilles heel of the scorpions. The scorpions were closed down because they were a mere creature of statute. They were created by a simple majority in parliament and they were dissolved by a simple majority in parliament. And the ability to command a simple majority of, in, 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 in parliament is not anything um, as difficult as the uh, ability to uh, get two thirds of parliamentarians to agree on anything. Uh, the, the ANC is the biggest uh, party in, in, in uh, the National Assembly at the moment, and they only have 57% of the seats. So if the ANC were to try and close down a Chapter 9 institution because it doesn't want a public protector or an Auditor General or a commission with the long name or perhaps even a gender commission anymore, it would have to be able to, across party lines, get at least two-thirds of uh, the, the uh, National Assembly to vote in favour of the constitutional change that would close down an existing Chapter 9 institution. So we, we have thought long and hard about it, and we don't know of any better way to ensure uh, security of tenure of office than to put your anti-corruption body into the constitutional armour of the Chapter 9 institutions. And if you look at Section 180 of the Constitution, you'll see that they are really made into a, a, a collection of bodies that, that have similar characteristics to uh, the judiciary. Their independence is protected. The uh, other organs of state interfering with them is not allowed. And the, the, they enjoy security. Getting rid of the public protector is a real nightmare, even though um, she, she should have gone years ago. Her position is very carefully uh, protected because the founders of the draft, drafters of the Constitution realized that you, you shouldn't be able to mess with independent institutions by hiring and firing their leadership at, at will. It has to be done uh, with more difficulty than, than uh, simply getting rid of an unwanted employee of the state. So we, we, uh, we sort of discern uh, moves in the right direction in the, in the Zuma administration. The SONA announcement was good, but it wasn't nearly as good as what the NEC of the of the ANC called for back in August last year, it passed an urgent resolution calling upon cabinet to establish what accountability now has been campaigning for since after Glenister II, which is a body in, 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 in different slightly different language, but with very much the same meaning. They wanted a specialized body. They wanted a standalone body. They wanted an independent body, and they wanted it to deal with corruption. And if you're going to get that recipe um, properly cooked, then you're going to have to have a STRS compliant body. And my research, my understanding of the Constitution is that you will not be able to get that right without creating a new 
Chapter 9 institution to do the job. That does involve a constitutional amendment, but you know, we, we're busy looking at the 18th Amendment, which is about expropriation without compensation. We've amended 17 times, and the sky has not fallen on Chicken Lickham's head yet. So um, let, 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 let's make that amendment because I think a lot of people drafting the Constitution thought that every uh, president would be as good as Nelson Mandela. And we now know that not every president has been as good as Nelson Mandela. I wanted to take the opportunity to thank those of you who are here live with us now. If you have questions for Paul, you can add those in the comment section and I'll present those to him in due course. Paul, you touched on amending the constitution and I wanted to get your take on expropriation without compensation and if in your view that opens up more possible avenues for corruption if you think that might simply add fuel to the fire as it were I'm, I'm uh, firmly of the view that the protection of property rights is an element of the rule of law if you accept that respecting property rights is an element of the rule of law, then an amendment of the dispensation that changes property rights to include what I call confiscation without uh, compensation, you are messing with the rule of law. The founders of the South African Constitution turned their faces against messing with the rule of law by inserting clauses in the constitution that are to the effect that if you want to do that you need to have a 75 percent majority to do so and i have told parliament so we made uh, submissions in 2018 uh, to parliament uh, pointing this um, pretty self-evident uh, jurisprudence out to the, uh, the initial committee that was dealing with it and again to the Motoli Mocheka uh, Commission, which is now sort of uh, uh, getting to the sharp end of the job. I believe that any attempt to change Section 25 of the Constitution, that's the property clause of the Bill of Rights, that is a, an, an attempt to impinge on the rule of law will be struck down by the Constitutional Court as being inconsistent with the Constitution. And I really do not see any sense at all in the notion of um, uh, expropriation without compensation, if you want to call it that, uh, in, in a country in which a new investment is required. Who is going to make a new investment in a country where you at risk of having your investment uh, expropriated? It, it, it makes no common sense or commercial sense or economic sense at all. And um, the, the, the ANC did hedge about its commitment to EWC with Let's do it in a way that doesn't upset the economy, doesn't uh, undermine food security and such like. I think that at the end of the day, they're going to either so dilute the bill that they are working on as to, as to make it hardly any different to what we have now, or if they don't, they're going to face a, a challenge from the Institute of Race Relations and others which will be backed by good jurisprudence from people far smarter than I am who agree that the um, messing with property rights is messing with the rule of law and can only be done by getting 75% of parliament to go along with it. And that is not going to happen because it's only the EFF and the ANC who support it at this stage. I hope that gives comfort to property owners in the audience. Well, at the moment, it doesn't seem that property owners are going to get any uh, assurance from banks or banking association, associations. So I'm glad that you're giving at least something. Paul, I wanted to get your take, and this is a, a big topic in and of its own, but 
so many South Africans have placed a lot of hope on the Zondo Commission and the work that is being done there. But there's a lot of frustration. Why aren't we seeing people being, you know, put in orange overalls? Yes, there dressed in orange. <laughs> well, okay, maybe maybe some people, but not the right. I'm dressed people. in orange. Come on now. <laughs> okay. What, uh, so what do you think of, of Zondo? I, I think what people tend to lose sight of. Um, you, you, you see Zondo in a, in a suit mm -hmm. presiding over the uh, commission, and you see advocates appearing before him not wearing any robes, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is that he is not clothed with the powers of a judge when he sits in the commission. He is in a commission of inquiry which is nothing more and nothing less than a tool of the executive branch of government. The president has the power to call a commission of inquiry into existence when some complex issue, some terrible event like um, Marikana or the arms deal or even the stampede at uh, Ellis Park Stadium has happened, and the members of the executive are, are running a country. They haven't got time to go into uh, the issue in the sort of depth that it deserves. And so they appoint a commission of inquiry. They put a lot of uh, expensive expertise at the inquiry's disposal. And the inquiry does two things. It, it, on the basis of the evidence that it's heard, it finds facts. So it says, I believe witness X, I don't believe witness Y. And on the basis of the facts so found, it makes recommendations. And the report of an inquiry sets out the facts that have been found and why they've been found and sets out the recommendations that the inquiry makes and why it is making those recommendations. And that gets presented to the president as the return on the investment of one billion South African rands that has gone into the Zondo Commission of Inquiry. And it is then up to the executive to decide what to do about the recommendations. And it is up to the Criminal Justice Administration to decide what to do about the facts that have been found. Nothing binds anybody. The, the findings of fact are not binding. The recommendations recommendations are also not binding. What uh, happens often is that um, recommendations are challenged, findings of fact are taken on review. The, the exercise is there for the information of the executive branch of government. It is not there for putting people in orange overalls. It is not there for raking back the loot. And it is certainly not there for manufacturing new laws, regulations, or whatever to, to address the problem. So uh, uh, the, the public expectations of the Zondo Commission, because a deputy chief justice is in charge, are perhaps somewhat inflated when you realize what it is that the commission is actually doing. Its job is find out what the facts are, make recommendations to see that those sort of uh, mal malfeasance and misfeasances do not occur again. And what is done with that is up to the executive and anybody who is fingered, who feels that he's been incorrectly fingered, is at liberty to take the finding against him or her on, on review. So I, I think that the Zondo Commission has been a necessary exercise. I think that it has been a valuable exercise. I think that it has put the ANC on trial in, in, uh, in, in a sense. It certainly uh, sobered up a lot of people and um, got, got uh, Mr. Zuma playing his last victim cards off the bottom of the pack. And um, uh, what is going to have to happen if any large-scale uh, prosecutions are to follow, if any successful uh, 
raking back of the loot of state capture is going to occur, is that there's going to have to be reform of the criminal justice administration by the creation of uh, a Chapter 9 anti-corruption body. And as far as the raking back of loot, especially the loot overseas is concerned, um, a special purpose vehicle should be created. It should take session of all the claims from state-owned enterprises and departments of state that have been looted, and it, on on its own uh, say so, should get on with litigating uh, to to get back the loot of state capture. There's more than a trillion rand floating around, and it's quite dis difficult in in the form of loot, and it's quite difficult to make that all disappear. And it doesn't help to invest it in the Cayman Islands or the Dubai skyscrapers or even in Kazakhstan because uh, the, the proceeds of corruption are uh, uh, su subject to being hunted down and recovered. Uh, Paul, we have a question from Mark Heaton. Mark, thank you for the question. Paul, do you think that making political parties have to disclose their donations will have any impact whatsoever? Surely the ANC will find a way to circumvent their requirements. Yes, I, I, I think that it, it certainly is designed to, to make uh, political parties more honest. But uh, when you have regard to the fact that the, the, the ANC has just approached the entire fundraising thing as, as if the national coffers are its piggy bank, then we we are we are we are, you know it's it's not it's not about donations it's about how they raise funds if they are raising uh, funds not not from donors but from subverting the state from going into business with Hitachi to form Hitachi Power Africa so that they can reap massive dividends out of the uh, the contract to build Madupi well that's not going to be affected by by the the legislation. I think that we, uh, we, we, we're probably going to have to cross a few more bridges about uh, get, getting the IEC to get real about what is a fair election when one party in the election is raising funds in, in, in that kind of way and everybody else is, ask, is passing the hat around and asking for donations from those sufficiently well disposed towards it to, uh, to make a donation. Our next question comes from Casey Wood. Thank you, Casey. Um, is it possible for a, uh, for a ruling party to have influence over the Chapter 9 institutions? For example, if friends are filling the positions. I, I, we've seen in the last week, I think it's Minister Mantash squirming a bit around Carter deployment. And is it Carter deployment? Is it not? Is it ANC policy or not? So maybe this also feeds into that sort of idea. Yes, I, I, I do believe that there is a need for a, an independent um, commission for appointments and disappointments to be formed. I think it could become a, uh, a, a forum not only for appointing judges, because the Judicial Service Commission has not covered itself in glory in the last two weeks, um, and for the appointment of the heads of Chapter 9s and so on. And that commission for appointments and disappointments should not have uh, uh, politicians infesting it, because at the moment it is so that uh, uh, pe people well disposed towards the ANC tend to find themselves at the top. Now, uh, um, and 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 that does tend to affect the. Uh, uh, the performance in terms of its in the independence of the uh, the chapter nine institutions, but you know you can have the best dispensation in the world if it's only as good as the people who are driving that dispensation. So uh, I I think if you look at the the two favourite examples of things that have gone wrong for the ANC. The biggest mistake that Jacob Zuma ever made was to appoint Tuli Modonsela as the uh, public protector in South Africa. Now, she was a well-connected ANC um, supporter, soft-spoken, and he miscalculated completely 
when he thought that it would be okay for him to manipulate or ride roughshod over her. She read what her mandate is in her enabling legislation and in the Constitution itself. She litigated against her president in relation to what um, taking appropriate remedial steps really means, and she won. And to her great credit, she stood up against Mr. Zuma on the complaints about the state capture or the repurposing of the state or the silent coup or whatever you'd like to call it. And uh, through her doing, the Zondo Commission exists today. So uh, you can't call her a stooge of the ANC who did the ANC's bidding at every uh, step of the way. And uh, while, while there may be others who preceded her and others in other Chapter 9 institutions who can have fingers pointed at them, uh, the, the point of the story is that if you have a, an appointments and disappointments that's putting into and removing from office uh, important people in the judiciary and the Chapter 9 institutions, even in the police and the public administration, you, 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 you can bring about a situation where the cronyism that uh, is at the root of so much corruption is not given the opportunity of taking root. The other example is Vusi Pikoli, another faithful cadre of the, uh, the ANC. His children call him a battered wife of the ANC. Because he was sended by Tabo Becky for going after our police commissioner, Mr. Jackie Sandebi, who was subsequently found guilty of corruption. And he was fired during the McLuntley period for going after Jacob Zuma, who we know has yet to face the trial on those very charges that um, Vusi Bikoli was pressing. Now, I wasn't surprised to see Vusi Bikoli answering a letter that I put in the uh, in, in the uh, business day recently and saying that in his view, executive interference in the work of the criminal justice administration should be criminalized. Any politician in the executive who seeks to interfere with those doing their independent work in criminal justice administration should go to jail themselves, which I, th I think is a, a wonderful idea. I'm just sorry I didn't have it myself. There was a, an idea in the book that I wanted you to elaborate on a little bit, and that was the the idea from Richard Goldstone on an anti-corruption court. Can you expand a bit on that, how you would envision that sort of thing coming about, I guess, the process that would be needed and why you think something like that could be, could be good? Yes, Chris, you're referring to the International Anti-Corruption Court, mm -hmm. which would work on the same basis that the International Criminal Court works against crimes against humanity and genocide and so on. But it would be in the field of corruption rather than um, the, the, the gross crimes against humanity that the ICC deals with. So if you accept that it is working on the basis of complementarity, that means that the International Anti-Corruption Court would only swing into action when it is established that the national courts are doing nothing about a Jacob Zuma-like person, which I think we would have been able to establish in South Africa because there was clearly no political will to, uh, to prosecute him. And it took from April 2009, when Lindiwe Mazibuku and Helen Zilla rushed off to uh, bring an urgent application in the Pretoria High Court because Zuma was, was uh, not being prosecuted until October 2017 for the, for the Supreme Court of Appeal to say, excuse me, this is wrong, he should be prosecuted. So that's an incredibly long time. And in that period, if there were an international anti-corruption court, it would have been possible for the Free Market Foundation or some other civil society actor to go to an international anti-corruption court 
uh, which would probably sit in The Hague or in Canada or somewhere far away, maybe one in Africa or a branch in Africa somewhere, and lay the criminal complaint against the kleptocrat uh, involved, against the, those guilty of grand corruption. And that court would exercise jurisdiction over those high crimes of, of corruption in a way that would freeze the um, money involved upon conviction, address the return of the money involved, and would also uh, impose appropriate punishment on those charged. Um, it's, it's, it's an idea that will be, theoretically anyway, will be on the table in the United Nations in June or maybe later um, because of COVID uh, at, at a General Assembly special session on corruption. But um, it's, it's not an idea that has a great deal of uh, political traction, mainly because too many people in high places fear that they would find themselves in the dock in the International Anti-Corruption Court. And um, we all know that America has not supported the, the ICC, and I don't see the Americans. Maybe Joe Biden would take a different view, but... Um, it, it will be difficult to make it happen. But, you know, it was difficult to make the ICC happen. And everybody thought apartheid was going to last forever, and it didn't. So uh, if the, it's once again a question of political will. And if the political will can be summoned, and you can actually find more traction for this in the countries where the loot is hidden. So if Switzerland has got no appetite for uh, prosecuting people who've brought hot money into the country, they can say to the, to the International Anti-Corruption Court, uh, we're not so sure about this money that's sitting in our, our accounts here in Zurich. Won't, won't, won't you please um, investigate it and uh, charge anybody who's broken the law? And it takes all the political heat off the host country. And of course, we know that the, uh, the, the host countries are far fewer than the countries who, who, who get uh, raped and pillaged by the corrupt. Next up, we have a two-part question. Well, it's the same theme, but from two different people. So from Michael Setos and from Cynthia Stimple. Thank you both for the question. So Mike asked, uh, how do corporate and public citizens go about properly holding politicians to account and then Cynthia adds to that can we as ordinary people start campaigning for a chapter nine integrity institution how can we as citizens focus on that and play our part yes thank, thank you uh, thank you for those questions they both they both uh, I think um, equally difficult and I, I, I suspect that the um, the traction for the idea of an anti-corruption commission has to come from uh, the, the people because it's not going to come from the politicians. I, I think that um, the, the NEC of the ANC, when it passed that resolution that I mentioned earlier in August last year, calling for what essentially is a, a Chapter 9 um, institution, um, really took the view that they needed to keep up with the pressure that is coming from civil society organizations. One of the difficulties I have with the level of organization in civil society in South Africa at, at the moment is that a lot of anger gets expressed, a, a lot of uh, chanting and dancing and singing happens, but there is very little focus to the demands that are made by Save South Africa or Defend Our Democracy or uh, Action SA or whichever, whichever pressure group it may be, there's, there's, there's not, when it comes to corruption anyway, there's not sufficient focus on the how-to of addressing the problem. Yes, everybody knows there's far too much corruption in South Africa. Yes. Everybody knows it's threatening the existence of our country, but not everybody has a clear idea 
of what needs to be done, what can be done politically as well, to address it. So pressure from civil society uh, is, is really what brought about the new South Africa in the first place. And if we are all relaxing in our freed status, thinking that freedom is a gift rather than a responsibility which you have to exercise, then we, we are lost. But if we take the responsible attitude in relation to the, the way in which our freedom is being messed up by, by corrupt people, then it is possible to, to coalesce around sensible demands for suitable reforms. It's not as though we're working in the dark here. The Constitutional Court has given what is a binding finding in the Glenister uh, litigation, the stirs requirements of the, uh, of the, uh, the court, the specialized, trained, independent, resourced and secure uh, entity that is required to effectively and efficiently, that's another constitutional requirement, uh, see off the corrupt. Those, those things are there already. What needs to happen is the political will to deal with them, uh, to, to make them happen, is, is required. And if you put enough fear into politicians that they are at risk of losing their positions of power and authority in parliament, they very rapidly work out that uh, it, it's necessary to come up with a solution such as the solution that has been proposed by the NEC last year and has been punted by accountability now for the last 10 years. So you see how the wheels grind slowly, but they get, they get there eventually. And now I've forgotten Michael's question. You better help me again. Michael's question was just a bit broader around what citizens can do, but I think you've... Yeah, no, no, I think you... Yeah, you You've got, you see, the, the problem in South Africa, uh, Michael, is that the, the, the way in which the old fogies grew up and the way in which they teach their children to think is that you are a passive subject living in an authoritarian order. What the man with the waggly finger says goes. And that is not what the new South Africa should be about. We are a participative constitutional democracy. We are allowed to have our say. We are allowed to go to parliament. We are allowed to say to the Justice Portfolio Committee, we want to have a, a debate on a Chapter 9 um, Integrity Commission to deal with corruption. We want to see um, the necessary legislation and constitutional amendment prepared. And once there is the level of accountability and responsiveness that is required in Section 1 of the Constitution, you will find with active citizens participating in their democracy rather than passive subjects bowing before the authority of those who happen to have got the most votes, that it is possible at a, at a very fundamental, basic level, to make a difference to the way in which our society is run. It is our society, it belongs to us, and it really, it, it's our own fault if we allow corrupt people to steal from, from the poor and to, to bring about the failure of our state. It, it deserves a better future. In the spirit of giving tools and advice to those in government of all levels who see the problems and want to try and handle them in some way, fight back, I wanted to highlight, or you to highlight, uh, Appendix 3 of the book, which focused on the resolution taken at the last conference. You know, As you mentioned, this book came out of a series of conferences. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I must say it's it's four conferences altogether, and then there was a, a further workshop on corruption in the judiciary, which is a topic is far too hot for us to discuss today. But um, <laughs> the the third appendix is 
it, it, it builds on what was um, resolved at previous conferences. There was no formal uh, resolution at the end of the first conference, but there were some ideas. The end of the second conference, there was a formal resolution, and at the uh, the uh, Entebbe conference in 2017, the, uh, the the document which is now called Appendix Three to the book is is really a comprehensive nuts and bolts look at every aspect of uh, countering corruption that occurred to delegates who were at the last of four conferences and who were applying their minds to the accumulated wisdom that came out from judges, professors, uh, priests, trade unionists, business people, educators, all sorts had a go at how they saw the problem and and, and from it flowed uh, this uh, this resolution which is easy to find i think it's page 145 of the uh, of of the text and the text is 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 on the website i'm not going to presume to read it now because i will put everybody to sleep but the uh, certainly the stirs criteria uh, are in there there's some other very good ideas in there Kata Regan came to the first conference and she pointed out to us that the World Bank doesn't get involved with approving corruption and fraud in any of the contracts in which it has lent money. It just insists that it gets verifiable invoices every month and if verifiable invoices don't come, they stop the, the flow of the, of, of the money and they put the contractor on a blacklist so that the contractor can never work for the World Bank again or cannot work for the World Bank for a specified period if it's not a seriously bad uh, mess. And they have no trouble at all because the contractors prefer to have repeat business from the World Bank rather than to, uh, to, to, to run the risks that are involved in uh, a fa fancy bookkeeping that doesn't quite balance. One last question I had, and then we'll wrap up with the last questions and the comments from the viewers. I wanted to talk a little bit about the lots of the whistleblower. I mean, just last week, we had Mosile Motepu, who, as the then CEO of Trillion Financial Advisory, she wrote this piece in the Financial Mail last week. And for anyone who hasn't read it yet, I would advise that you go and do so when she realized she was being used in state she capture. I mean, the, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, a lot of people, you know, we, we, we hear stories of the whistleblowers, we see what comes out in some ways, you know, Agrizi himself was a, a whistleblower. So how, what about the lot of them? Are we doing enough to support them? Yes, well, you do get different kinds of whistleblowers. You get whistleblowers who are in the uh, corrupt plot and uh, decide to try and redeem themselves or, right. or they repent of their actions. And you get others who come across a, um, uh, an illegal transaction, like Cynthia Stimple, who asked the question just now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cynthia has written, kindly written, a chapter for this book on um, whistleblower protection. And I think it's very clear that in South Africa, whistleblower protection is inadequate at accountability now and with other um, uh, pressure groups there is a, a move afoot not only to change the legislation protecting whistleblowers, which is far too concentrated on the employment relationship, but the, even there doesn't work as well as it might, but to, to broaden it so, so that anybody who comes across malfeasance and wishes to blow the whistle can get protection. What we would like to see, and I think it would probably work better as a civil society initiative rather than a state initiative, is the formation of a whistleblower protection fund which looks after the um, uh, material needs of a whistleblower who, is, who has been put out of his or her job by uh, as, as a consequence of, of the blowing of the whistle, 
we, we want to be able to use funds there to uh, use legal services, to use psychiatric services, and to keep body and soul together so that the whistleblower can be rehab rehabilitated, um, uh, restored to a, a respectable position in society in the minimum of time. And uh, we believe that this could be funded quite uh, comfortably if uh, unions agreed that a few cents of every monthly contribution from every member should go into the fund. And if insurance companies agreed that uh, premiums on new policies should have a little option that you tick that says, I'm prepared to allow part of my premium to go towards a whistleblower protection fund. Um, the other aspect on whistleblowing that does need attention is the, um, the uh, witness protection legislation is far too narrow. You have to be a witness in a pending criminal trial in order to get into a witness uh, uh, protection program. In fact, that should be broadened so that if you are a potential witness who is in a, uh, a threatened position, you can be put in a witness protection program, which involves hiding your identity, uh, move, moving to another location, and uh, Cha cha changing all of your self cell phone numbers and ge generally taking on a, an identity that keeps you out of the um, the crosshairs of the baddies who might be looking to silence you before you give your evidence. But I I, I commend the uh, the whistleblower chapter that Cynthia wrote. It's it it, it certainly um, s speaks truth to power and is is is, is spoken in the light of painful experience that saved you and me 248,000 rands of taxpayers' money that was going to go west at uh, um, South African Airways, where she was previously the treasurer. I think supporting whistleblowers in any way we can is probably one of the most important things we can do, as, as you say, as citizens in a participatory democracy. Otherwise, the sort of idea of democracy and accountability may be falls flat a bit. So, Paul, we're going to wrap up now with a final question from Stuart Pennington. You can also include in this any final thoughts you have, any pearls of wisdom that you want to share on a closing note. But Stuart just asked, based on the Zondo Commission evidence, surely SARS can initiate investigations into the corruption, corruption allegations independent of the executive? Yes, well, SARS has been given uh, some prosecutorial powers, mainly in respect of people who don't pay their taxes. But they, they are not prosecutors. They're, they're, at the moment in South Africa, there's a single prosecution service. Um, there are exceptions to it, like municipal courts and military courts and so on. But generally speaking, and certainly in relation to corruption, the work of prosecuting is, is reserved to the uh, National Prosecuting Authority, and there's only very limited capacity and indeed uh, enabling legislation at SARS that is, is there to see to it that, that, that people pay their taxes. But um, uh, e even a tax evasion case is, is run by the National Prosecuting Authority and not by SARS. And I, I think breaking it up into too many um, institutions is not a good idea because that's what the anti-corruption task team has been around during the Zuma years was about and it, it never got anywhere with any uh, pro proper um, investigations or prosecutions at all. So the, the, the way to solve the problem of grand corruption in South Africa is to combine the investigative and the prosecuting functions in a body that is there to prevent, combat, investigate, and prosecute uh, grand corruption. And th that with the right people. And it's not as though the right people don't exist. We know that the Scorpions were good at what they were doing. If they can be lured back into the, uh, into the Chapter 9 Integrity Commission 
um, that, that's the way to do it. And uh, I, I think that, um, that 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 is what needs to be worked on at the moment. And we are working on it. The book is part of the work, but we are uh, uh, we we have a, a three pronged approach. We do a lot of advocacy, which is what I've been doing all afternoon with you. We do a lot of lobbying of people who are in powerful positions, whether they in government or in opposition or in business. We, we, we lobby them with a view to getting the um, the anti-corruption machinery going. And all else fails, there's always fairness to fall, to fall back on. The fourth visit of the same litigant to the same court with the same problem. It'll be a world record. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I think we'll we'll end there. We have to thank you very much for your time this afternoon, for having the opportunity to talk to you. So thank you very much for coming onto the show. Uh, it's been my pleasure, and um, I, I hope that I haven't left any questioners with a sour taste in their mouth or a feeling that I haven't answered um, as as uh, fully as as might be the case. But um, we're out there, and we are are working constantly on uh, exacting accountability and promoting responsiveness to the needs of ordinary people. That's what accountability now is about. Let me just give the email address, not the email, the uh, the web address of accountabilitynow.org.za because you can see the book and certainly you you hit on uh, the uh, the correct appendix, appendix three, which is really a consolidation in a page and a half or so, how many pages is, um, of the the uh, the thinking that went into those four conferences and a lot of clever people um, participated and gave of their best. And the book is really just a posy of other people's flowers that I've collected and, and uh, put into, uh, into print so that it doesn't disappear in a a dusty conference report that is too boring to read. I can highly recommend going to accountabilitynow.org.za, try and find out more about the organization and the work that they do. To the viewers and listeners, thank you for being with us this afternoon. As always, we greatly appreciate your time, your support, uh, your comments, engaging with us. Uh, it makes it all the more worthwhile that we get to do these episodes and use this platform to spread what we think are the most important ideas for in some ways, leading South Africa in a better direction for, for all its citizens. Remember, if you haven't yet to like the video before you leave, please also share it on your different social media platforms. And finally, subscribe to our channel. If you are uh, able to, please also consider supporting the Free Market Foundation. You can go to www.freemarketfoundation.com to assist us in all the work that we do. And there you can also find all of our articles, press releases, research and submissions. Look forward to more episodes like these in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll have more for you in store very soon. In the meantime, keep well, stay safe, especially if you're in certain areas of Cape Town. Uh, the fire has been contained, apparently, but you can never be too careful with these things. So be on the lookout and be as careful as possible. Have a good evening. We'll talk to you again very soon. Bye-bye.